just give thanks, worship God, glorify the name of the Lord. He is a good God. He is our Father. We need to honor Him in praises. We need to honor Him in thanksgiving. We need to honor Him with all that we have. Glorify the name of the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Tell God that the God of heaven will fill all of us with knowledge, understanding, and wisdom of God. And that in it we will grow in grace. We will be heavenly minded. Abhor all worldliness and increase in the love of God and His Word. Pray that this will be your lot. As you come this morning, you want to remain in the grace of the Most High. I want you to pray and say, God, I want to be prepared for the imminent return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It may be now, it may be in the noon or at night. Tell God to clean up your heart and make you to live a normal Christian life. The God of heaven, Jesus, will come soon. And you want to pray, you will not be found wanting. In Jesus' name we pray. Tell God, have your way in the life of these young people. The future leaders of this church, that God will capture them now and polish them in the similitude of a palace. God will do that. That the Lord God will grant him more anointing, more unction, more power, and enlarge his coast tremendously. Tell the Lord of heaven that no power of darkness will be able to stand against his life and ministry. Tell God that God will grant him divine revelations and inspiration as he prepares for all his ministrations. Talk to God and that God will prolong his days here on earth and prosper his ministry continuously. Tell the Lord, pray and ask God Almighty. In Jesus' name we pray. The Lord has answered our prayers. You believe that you say bigger amen? amen. Father, we are grateful to you for this time. We thank you because your name will continue to be honored. Your name will continue to be glorified. Father, we give glory to your name because you have given to us a privilege to come to worship you today. And we're praying that God, you will bless us. Your heart will be deposited in every heart. And we're glorifying your name because we know you have answered all our prayers. As we continue, continue with us. Be with us, guide us, direct us. In Jesus' name we pray. Another amen. amen. Another one. Amen. The Lord will be with you. Gospel hymns and songs, number 249. Gospel hymns and songs. Number 249. Come, say the praise of Jesus. Come, sing the praise of Jesus. Sing his love with hearts aflame. Sing his wondrous birth of Mary. When to save the world he came. Tell the life he lived for others. And his mighty deeds proclaim. For Jesus Christ is king. When foes arose and slew him, he was victor in the fight. Over death and hell he triumphed. In his resurrection mind, 
he has raised a fallen manhood and enthroned in it in the eyes. For Jesus Christ is king. There is joy for all who serve him. More than woman tongue can say, there is pardon for the sinner, and the night is turned to day. There is healing for our sorrows. There is music all the way. For Jesus Christ is king. We witness to his beauty, and we spread his love abroad, and we cleave the oaths of darkness with the spirit's piercing sword. We will lead the souls in prison to the freedom of the Lord. For Jesus Christ is king. To Jesus be the glory, the dominion, and the praise. He is the Lord of all creation. He is guide of all our ways. And the world shall be his empire in the fullness of the days. For Jesus Christ is king. Praise and glory be to Jesus. Praise and glory be to Jesus. Praise and glory be to Jesus. For Jesus Christ is King. Be 
class. You are welcome to our Sunday scripture session today in Jesus' name. Shall we close our eyes to pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us together today to worship you in spirit and in truth. We are asking that as we come to search the scriptures this day, we pray that you will open our understanding. We pray that you reveal yourself to us in a new way, in the name of Jesus. We are asking that the entrance of your word will give us light, give us understanding, and you will give us the grace to be doers of the words we are learning in Jesus' name. We pray that your spirit will grant us understanding, that the word will mix with faith in every heart, and the blessings of God will be upon our lives in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. Let me hear your amen. Last Sunday, in our Sunday scriptures, we dealt with the prayer for deliverance. And in that study, we saw the psalmist that it was in a time of crisis, and then in time of crisis, what did he do? He called on God for deliverance, and he had confidence in God that God will answer his prayer. He trusted in the faithfulness of God, and there was divine intervention on his behalf. There we learn that in our times of crisis, we should go to the Lord in prayer, trusting him, having confidence in his faithfulness, and the Lord will intervene on our behalf in Jesus' name. Today we are moving forward in our study, and the topic today is praise and thanksgiving for God's majesty. Praise and thanksgiving for God's majesty. Our memory verse today is taken from Psalms chapter 9, in verse 1. The book of Psalms chapter 9, verse 1. We are going to take it together after a count of two. One, two, go. I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will show forth all thy marvelous works. Can we take it once again? One, two, go. I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will show forth all thy marvelous works. Psalms chapter 9, in verse 1. Our text today is taken from two chapters of the psalm. Psalm chapter 8, verses 1 to 9, and chapter 9, verses 1 to 20. The psalmist's solemn meditation, admiration, and appreciation of God's glory, goodness, and greatness, with his determination to praise the Lord and show forth his marvelous works, is our focus in our study today. 
he begins with acknowledgement of the excellency of his name. That's why it said in chapter 8, verse 1, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. And he concludes with thanksgiving and praises for his greatness, mighty acts, protection over his people, and judgment against his enemies. In Psalm chapter 9, verse 1, he then make a commitment by saying, I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will show forth thy marvelous works. That ought to be the commitment of every child of God, to give praises unto the Lord. Last week we saw he prayed for deliverance. And when we pray for deliverance, and then God answers our prayers, then we must return and give praises and thanksgiving unto the Lord. David's habit of meditation on the acts of God's goodness and manifestation help him to maintain an attitude of gratitude and praise to God. And as believers, we must always meditate and remember the acts of God's faithfulness is goodness unto us. This will enable us to maintain the spirit of worship and adoration to him always. In Psalm 103, Psalm 103 from verse 1, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgiveth all thy iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemed thy life from destruction, who crowned thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfied thy mouth with good things, so that the youth is renewed like the eagles. We must constantly meditate on all these benefits, all the goodness of God. Psalm 68 verse 19 says, Blessed be the Lord, which daily loaded us with benefits. Every day he loads us with benefits. We must bring appreciation and praises unto God. The majesty, the greatness and omnipotence, and the goodness of God constitute a compelling inspiration for man to give praises and offer thanksgiving to him at all times. In view of the unspeakable love, unspeakable gift he has bestowed on us that he has manifested to us through his son Jesus Christ. We ought to offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually that he is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. That's in Hebrews chapter 13 verse 15. Question number one. Briefly explain why the psalmist maintained an attitude of praise and thanksgiving to God. He maintained that attitude because he always meditates on the goodness of God, on the mercies of God, on the protection and the preservation of God. He meditates and then he recalls all that God has done for him. And then he's able to give thanks unto the Lord. The same thing we must be doing as believers. We should look back. And, and remember, all that the Lord has done in our lives, then we give him praises and appreciation. As we look at this study, we are considering three points. Number one is the excellency of God and his majesty. The excellency of God and his majesty. In chapter 8, I read verse 1. He says, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. In verse 9, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. The name of the Lord is excellent. The psalmist with deep sense of reverence claims, O Lord, our Lord. 
how excellent is thy name. The name of the Lord is the most excellent in all the earth. There is no other name, no other power, no other being that can be compared unto him. And he says, who has set thy glory above the heavens. In all ages, the majesty of God's greatness has always captivated spiritual and thoughtful men and women. The wonders of creation has inspired songs of praise and worship because it is great and marvelous in all generations. A songwriter captures it in these words, O oh Lord my God, when I awesome wonder, consider all the works thy hands has made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art. Considering the wonders of nature, the diversity of animals in their kingdoms, the plants and vegetation, visible and invisible marvels of microscopic world, the billions of stars in the galaxies, and the exquisite simplicity and complexity of the snowflakes. The majesty of God is beyond human expression. No one can be likened unto him. His glory is above all. All things were made by him, and for his pleasure they were, and were created. Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. In Psalm 19, in verse 1, open your Bible, Psalm 19, verse 1. It says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth his handiwork. God's wonderful works of creation and providence testify to the whole world of his greatness, of his omnipotence, of his glory, and of his perfection. He is the fountain of all beings. We all flow from him, the sovereign ruler, the powerful protector and bountiful benefactor of all the creatures. His glorious name in all the earth is great, illustrious, and magnificent. Reflecting on the special honors God has put on feeble and insignificant man, the psalmist with great wonder in our text, Psalm chapter 8, in verse 4. Open your Bible, please. We are searching the scriptures. What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou has made him a little lower than the angels, and has crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. God puts man in this exalted position. It gave him dominion over all the works of his hands. The psalmist feels that it was an act of signal honor that God bestowed so great privilege upon feeble and frail man he created. He created and put everything in place for his comfort, welfare, and fulfillment. Although this reference by expression also applies to Jesus Christ our Savior, in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 6 to 9, God has honored man above his creatures and gave him dominion over all the works of his hand. The dominion God gave in Adam was lost in Adam through the fall of man, but in Christ Jesus we regain the dominion. And as many, because Christ came, he became man, he went to the cross, he took our place, he took our place so that we can be like him. 
And then the dominion that we lost in Adam will regain back in Christ Jesus. And if you are there, you are here to regain that dominion by turning in your life to Jesus, by accepting the sacrifice he made on the cross for you. This is your day so that you can regain your dominion through Christ Jesus. What entitles man to so much benefits and benevolence? Nothing. In view of this, believers have every reason to join the psalmist to offer ceaseless praise and thanksgiving unto the Lord. In the book of Psalms, chapter 107, Psalm 107, I read in verse 8. There it says, Oh, that men will praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Verse 15, Oh, that men will praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Verse 21, Oh, that men will praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Verse 31, Oh, that men will praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. It is so important to our praise and thanksgiving to God for his wonderful works in our lives, in our families, and in everything that the Lord has done for us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and in verse 57, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in verse 57. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We must always remember our victory in Christ Jesus and thereby give thanks unto the Lord. Why must we give thanks to the Lord? Why must we give thanks to the Lord as believers? Number one, because of his display of creative power and perfection. When you look at creation, you look at the power of God that created all that we see, including man, the chief of God's creation. We see the display of God's power. We see perfection in everything that God has done. Number two, because of the gift of life, he gave us life to live. He gave us the physical life. He gave us spiritual life through salvation in Christ Jesus. For all this, we must praise the Lord. Number three, for his deliverance, protection, preservation, and provision, good health, and all other blessings too numerous to mention. That's why Psalm 68 verse 19 says, Blessed be the Lord, which daily loaded us with benefits. We cannot name them all. For all those benefits and blessings, we must praise the Lord. Number four, we owe God our praises and gratitude because it is a direct command to do so. Open your Bible, Psalm 100 in verses 4 and 5. Psalm 100 verses 4 and 5. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and his cause with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. So for all that, for the mercy of God, for his truth, for his goodness, we must offer praises and thanksgiving to God. Number five, our praises and thanksgiving glorify God and attract more blessing. Psalm 50 verse 23 says, He who so offereth praise glorifieth me. When you are praising God, when you are giving thanks to God, you are glorifying the name of the Lord. And finally, more importantly, we are to praise and thank God for our redemption. 
And it's all embracing benefits through Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Our salvation, freedom from sin, freedom from guilt and the penalty of sin. Our sicknesses were healed by his stripes. All the benefits of redemption, for them we must praise the Lord. Let's answer this question. Give reasons why believers should always praise and give thanks unto the Lord. We have just mentioned a lot of them for the mercies of God over our lives, over our families. Look at the protection and the preservation of God over us during this COVID-19. There has not been any report from any of our member of any infection. It is the goodness of God. For it, we must praise the Lord. For our redemption, salvation from sin, freedom from sin, and healing and health, innumerable blessings, we must praise the Lord. But we must understand, although it is everyone who has the freedom to offer thanks and give praises unto the Lord, but it is not all praises and thanksgiving that will be acceptable. It is only the praises from those who fear and honor God that will receive immediate attention from heaven. The scriptures in Psalm 113 verse 1, it says, Praise ye the Lord. Praise, O ye servants of the Lord. That means he's calling the servants of the Lord to praise him. In Psalm 140 verse 13, Surely the righteous shall give thanks unto thy name. The upright shall dwell in thy presence. So, who are the servants of God? Refer to here, call to praise the Lord. Servants of God today are those who have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus from their sins and made children of God. Those are the people referred to as servants of God. They are clothed with a garment of righteousness. The Lord Jesus had been made sin for us to give us his own righteousness. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. And then they do no iniquity. They serve God with all their hearts. They serve God with all their soul and their mind. Those are the people whose praises will be acceptable. They live holy and righteous lives before the Lord, a life that pleases the Lord. But for those who are dead in sins and trespasses, their prayers and praises are counted as abomination before God. Look at Proverbs chapter 21 and in verse 27. Proverbs chapter 21 in verse 27. Proverbs 21, please open your Bible. Chapter 21, verse 27. The sacrifice of the wicked is abomination. How much more when he bringeth it with a wicked mind? So if you are a wicked man, don't just say, I like to praise the Lord. I like to offer gifts unto the Lord. First of all, settle your life. Come out of wickedness. Repent of your sins. Accept Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior. And let him save you. And then begin to live a life of holiness and righteousness in the presence of the Lord. Then and only then will your sacrifice, your praises and thanksgiving be acceptable in the sight of the Lord. In Isaiah chapter 1 verse 15. And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Therefore, repent, turn unto the Lord. The psalmist in Psalm 66 verse 18, he says, If I allow iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. He will not answer my prayer. I pray that everyone who wants to offer an acceptable praise to God, you will turn away from your sins 
and you surrender your life to the Lord in Jesus' name. We come to point number two in the study today. And point number two is execution of judgment on God's enemies and the deliverance of his people. God will judge his enemies, but he will deliver his people definitely. In our text, in uh, Psalm chapter 9, reading from verse 3, When my enemies are torn back, they shall fall and perish at thy presence. For thou hast maintained my right and my cause. Thou satest in the throne, judging right. Thou hast rebuked the hidden. Thou hast destroyed the wicked. Thou hast put out their name forever and ever. O thy enemy, destruction has come to a perpetual end. And thou hast destroyed cities. Thy memorial is perished with them. But the Lord shall endure forever. He has prepared his throne for judgment. And he shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness. That is talking about God as the God of judgment. He will judge and his judgment will be the judgment of righteousness. The psalmist, moved by the Spirit of God, rejoiced in the Lord for rescuing him and his people from the hand of their enemies. He concludes that the Lord helps those who are helpless and punishes the wicked. In Psalm 9, verse 3, when my enemies are torn back, they shall fall and perish at thy presence. That is the judgment of God upon the enemies of God's people. He spoke so loudly of his triumph over his enemies and the numerous adversaries of God's people. In Psalms chapter 3, in verse 7, Psalm chapter 3, verse 7, Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all my enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. That's what God does to the enemy of God's people, and that's what he will continue to do. In 2 Samuel chapter 22, 2 Samuel chapter 22, and we are reading from verse 38. Please open your Bible. 2 Samuel 22, verse 38. I have pursued my enemies and destroyed them and turned not again until I had consumed them. I have consumed them and wounded them and they could not arise. Yea, they are falling under my feet. For thou hast guarded me with strength to battle. Them that rose up against me as thou subdued under me. Thou hast also given me the nest of my enemies, that I might destroy them that hate me. They looked, but there was none to say. Even the Lord, but he answered them. Not then did I beat them as small as the dust of the earth. I did stamp them as the mire of the street, and did spread them abroad. Thou hast delivered me from the striving of my people. Thou hast kept me to be head of the hidden, a people which I know not shall serve me. Strangers shall submit themselves unto me. As soon as they hear, they shall be obedient unto me. Strangers shall fade away, and they shall be afraid out of their close places. The Lord liveth, and blessed be my rock, and exalted be the God of the rock of my salvation. So, the psalmist spoke much about his victory and the victory of God's people. And it is this, still the same God that we are serving. 
is going to give us victory over all the enemies of God, the enemies of the church, in the mighty name of Jesus. Can I hear your amen? Amen. In the book of Psalms, chapter 6, and in verse 10, let all my enemies be ashamed and so vexed. Let them return and be ashamed suddenly. All the enemy of God's people, they will be ashamed in the mighty name of Jesus. The enemies of God's people are always not able to defeat them because he is on their side due to their relationship with him. God protects and delivers them from destruction. And if you want to have victory over all adversaries, over all enemies and foes, we must have a cordial relationship with the Lord through salvation of our soul and maintain of holy lives. In the book of Esther, chapter 9, and in verse 5, Esther chapter 9, verse 5, please open your Bible. Thus the Jews smote all their enemies with a stroke of the sword, and slaughter and destruction, and did what they would unto those that hated them. The table was torn. They wanted to destroy the Jews, but the table turned, and God gave them victory over all their enemies. God will give us victory over all our enemies, over all the adversaries of the church in Jesus' name. In Psalm 107, verse 20, he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from all their destruction. The Lord will deliver us in Jesus' name. Children of God are assured of divine presence because their battle is the Lord's. Every battle of our lives, it is the Lord's battle. Our God is the God of battle. The man of war is his name. And he will fight all our battles and give us the victory in Jesus' name. I can't hear your amen. Say a louder amen. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 47. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Every battle that faces you, every battle that faces the church, is not our battle. If we are children of God, if we are obedient to the Lord, he will take over our battles, he will fight for us, and give us the victory as he did in days of old. Enemies who aim to hurt God's people, do so at their own peril and will incur divine indignation if they fail to surrender. As long as the children of Israel obey the Lord, their adversaries could not conquer them. The same assurance is available for you and me and for the entire church today. As we obey the Lord, as we put our faith and trust in him, no enemy will prevail against the church in Jesus' name. Jesus said, on this rock I build my church, and the gate of hell shall not prevail against it. They will not in Jesus' name. In the book of Job, chapter 14, verse 1, man that is born of a woman is of a few days and full of troubles, but the Lord remains our help and hope for survival. It will surely help us. It will give us help. It will give us victory in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. In Psalm 60, verse 11. Psalm 60, verse 11, open your Bible. Give us help from trouble, for vain is the help of man. True God, we shall do valiantly, for he is it that shall tread down our enemies. The Lord will give us the victory in Jesus' name. To have divine intervention, one must establish a redemptive relationship 
through the new birth experience, freedom from sin, coupled with daily unconditional obedience of God's word. And this will help believers to tap into God's power to navigate the path to victory. Number two, holy living is a blue word against the arrows and attacks of the enemy. Those who desire divine help in times of trouble should make holiness a priority in life. Number three, the scripture recommends that believers should put on the whole armor of God to enable them all overcome all the assaults of the wicked. Let's open our Bible to Ephesians chapter 6, reading from verse 10. Ephesians chapter 6, we read from verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wise of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. When we obey that, we will be more than conquerors in Jesus' name. While God manifests his power towards his chosen people by defending, fighting, protecting, and providing for them, he frowns at evildoers for rebelling against his word. He resists and he judges them. That's why in our text, in the, in the book of Psalms, Psalm 7, verse 11, it says, God judges the righteous, and God is angry with the wicked every day. Every day, a wicked man may be happy, but God is angry with him. When he's having a ceremony, he's happy, but because of wickedness, God is angry with him. Therefore, if you are there and you are practicing wickedness, that is the scripture. God is angry with you. What must you do? Turn away from your wickedness, repent, and surrender unto the Lord. All unrepentant sinners and wicked men who die in their sins will end up in eternal damnation. That's what Psalm chapter 9 verse 17 says. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all nations that forget God. What must we do then to help them? Believers should rise up in timely intervention to bring them out of their predicament. We should intercede regularly for sinners, conviction, and their conversion. Open your Bible with me to 1 Timothy chapter 2. We are reading from verse 1. 1 Timothy chapter 2. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplication, prayers, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. God wants them to be saved, so we must intercede for them. And then, number two, we must prayerfully reach out to them in personal evangelism, in friendship evangelism, mass evangelism, literature evangelism, and all other means of the gospel outreach to reach them before it is too late so that we can rescue them and bring them to the kingdom of God. Question number three, what particular stage should the righteous take to rescue the wicked from eternal damnation? We have just mentioned them. We must pray and intercede regularly for the sinner's conviction, 
and conversion. We must look for them, present and preach the gospel to them. We have gospel materials we can distribute to them. We can reach them on social media. And as we do, our labor will not be in vain. Our labor will be rewarded. God will bring them in, in Jesus' name. We come to point number three in our study today. And it is equity of God and his eternal rule over all. Equity of God and his eternal rule over all. God is the sovereign God. He's a God of justice. He's a God that will do no iniquity. He's a God with whom there is no partiality. Let's read from our text again. Psalm chapter 9, in verse 4. For thou hast maintained my right and my cause. Thou satest in thy throne, judging right. That's it. God is a righteous judge. He will judge righteously. No partiality with God. In verse 7. But the Lord shall endure forever. He has prepared his throne for judgment. And he shall judge the world in righteousness. He has ministered judgment to the people in uprightness. The judgment of God will be in uprightness because he is an upright God. In Psalm 103, Psalm 103, please open your Bible. We are reading there from verse 6. Psalm 103, in verse 6, there it says, the Lord executes righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. God will execute judgment for all those who are oppressed. Sephaniah chapter 3, in verse 5. Sephaniah chapter 3, and we are reading in verse 5. The just Lord is in the midst thereof. He will not do iniquity. Every morning does he bring his judgment to light. He faileth not, but the unjust knoweth no shame. God is a God of justice. He will not do iniquity. His judgment is right, and he does it in the light. God rules in heaven and over the earth and all that they are, are therein. His eternal rule is characterized by justice, righteousness, peace, and equity. The psalmist in verse 4 of our text says, thou, For thou hast maintained my rights and my cause. Thou satest in the throne, judging right. God is the judge. He sits in his throne and he gives righteous judgment. The psalmist admits that though his adversaries came upon him unprovoked and with cruelty, the Lord had proved his innocence by defending him. Children of God who maintain the right cause of salvation and true holiness can always trust the Lord to defend them in the days of adversity. It will be a refuge for the oppressed in times of trouble. That's what verse 9 of our text says. Psalm 9, verse 9. Please look at your Bible. The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. And that is what God has been. He has been a refuge for us during this pandemic and this troublous time. And we continue to be a refuge in the mighty name of Jesus. And he says, he shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness. That's in verse 8. He shall judge the world in righteousness. 
he shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness. The judgment of God will be according to his righteous character, and he will recompense to everyone in consonance with their works. God will not be partial. Whatever you have done, whatever is recorded against your name, that is what God will judge you with. Job 34 verse 11. Job 34 11. Please open your Bible and let's read together. For the work of a man shall be rendered unto him and cause every man to find according to his way. So, what is your works like? Are you doing evil secretly or openly? Thinking that nobody knows? God will judge you according to your works. In Proverbs chapter 24, please open your Bible again. Proverbs chapter 24, in verse 12. If thou sayest, Behold, we know it not. Does not he that pondereth the heart consider it? And he that keepeth thy soul, does not he know it? And shall not he render to every man according to his works? God will render to every man definitely according to their works. It reminds us and reminds all those who are sold to doing evil that the wicked shall be turned into hell and all nations that forget God. That's in a, a test, the Psalms chapter 9, verse 17. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Do you forget God? Judgment is coming. Before it is too late, this is the time to make amendment, to repent, and come unto the Lord. As the psalmist ponders on the righteous attributes of the Lord, he offers some striking prayers to God that are worthy of emulation. Let's look at them. Number one, he asked the Lord to have mercy on him so that he will show forth his praises before all people that they may rejoice in his salvation. Psalm 9, reading verse 13 and 14. Have mercy upon me, O Lord. Consider my trouble, which I suffer of them that hate me. Thou that lifted me up from the gates of death, that I may show forth all thy praises in the gaze of the daughter of Zion. I will rejoice in thy salvation. That's the psalmist asking the Lord to help him, to deliver him, to save him, to have mercy upon him so that he can offer praises unto the Lord. Number two, he requested passionately, that the law will arise quickly to stop the wicked in their stride and not to prevail over the righteous. We see that in verse 19. Arise, O Lord, let not man prevail. Let the hidden be judged in thy sight. And as we pray, the hidden will not prevail over us. They will not prevail over the church of God. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Can I hear your amen? Number three, he also pleads that the wicked have a measure of judgment in this world so as to strike fear into their hearts, into the hearts of those who are wont to do evil. In Psalm 9, verse 20, put them in fear, O Lord, that the nations may know themselves to be but men. Number four, finally he believes that the walls of humans will be humbled when they are made to see that 
they are but poor, feeble creatures compared to God. Verse 20 again, put them in fear, O Lord, that the nations may know themselves to be but men. In conclusion of our study today, from these two chapters of the psalm, chapters 8 and 9, which we have studied, we are taught the following. Number one, to praise and thank God continually because he is good and his mercy endures forever. Psalm chapter 9, verse 1, verse 2, and verse 14. I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will show forth all the marvelous works. I will be glad and rejoice in thee. I will sing praises to thy name, O thou most high. And then in verse 14, that I may show forth all thy praises in the gates of the daughters of Zion. I will rejoice in thy salvation. As believers, we must understand and remember that the purpose of our creation by God is that we should live for his glory and for his praise. In Isaiah chapter 43, Isaiah 43, there we look at verse 7 and verse 21. Even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. Verse 21, these people have I formed for myself. They shall show forth my praise. If you are not showing the praise of God, if you are not giving thanks, offering praises to God, you are not fulfilling the purpose of your creation. Number two, we learn he is excellent in power and majesty, and none can be compared unto him. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Number three, he rules in the affairs of men and watches over his children to prevent the wicked acts of the enemy. God is watching over you. He will prevent the enemy from touching you. We read in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 23, verse 14, Saul was seeking David every day to destroy him, but the Lord did not deliver David into his hand. God will not deliver us or our enemies in Jesus' name. Number four, he executes judgment over the whole earth, and none can resist him. His judgment is without partiality, is a righteous judge. Number six, those who make him their refuge should trust in him for protection and preservation. If God is your refuge, trust in him for protection and for preservation. He will not fail you in Jesus' name. And lastly, unbelievers should remember that eternal hell awaits those who forget God. And believers are to continue in righteousness and holiness until the end to guarantee eternity with the Lord. The Lord will help us in the mighty name of Jesus. Today we have studied on praise and thanksgiving for God's majesty. Let's rise up now and go to the Lord in prayer. Let's give thanks unto the Lord. Remember all the goodness of God, all the benefits of God in your life. All that he has done, all that he has wrought, is protection, is uh, preservation, our healing and health, and above all, our redemption, our salvation, our sanctification, our Holy Ghost power, everything that God has wrought in our lives, the hope of heaven we have, our names in the book of life. Let's praise the name of the Lord for all his mercies, for all his goodness, and always remember all the goodness of the Lord. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, the psalmist says, 
and forget not all his benefits. When you meditate and remember all the benefits of God, you'll be thankful and you'll be praiseworthy unto the Lord. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We bless your name because of what you have taught us in your word. Lord, we pray that the grace to be doers of the word you will give unto us in Jesus' name. We are praying, O oh Lord, for all your goodness, all your wonderful works in our lives. We say, accept our thanksgiving, our praise offering in the name of Jesus. And we pray for those who are yet to know you, those who are still in sin, those who are still in the way of evil. Father, you have given them warning that judgment is coming. I pray that you will help them to embrace the gospel, to repent and turn in their lives unto you so that their lives can be acceptable unto you and they can be preserved in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for all that have taught us today. As we do, as we obey, more of your blessings will flow into our lives in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, for the answer. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. Thank you, and God bless you.
GHS185.
for the Sunday message today, we shall have a brief period of scripture reading. The First Epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Corinthians The First Epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Corinthians 1 Corinthians 14 Follow after charity, and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification, and exhortation, and comfort. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. I would that ye all spake with tongues, but rather that ye prophesied. For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you, except I shall speak to you either by revelation, or by knowledge, or by prophesying, or by doctrine? And even things without life giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? So likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification. Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. Even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. Wherefore let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. Else when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say Amen at thy giving of thanks, seeing he understandeth not what thou sayest? For thou verily givest thanks well, but the other is not edified. I thank my God, I speak with tongues more than ye all. Yet in the church I had rather speak five words with my understanding, that by my voice I might teach others also, than ten thousand words in an unknown tongue. Brethren, be not children in understanding. Howbeit in malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. In the law it is written, With men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people, and yet for all that will they not hear me, saith the Lord. Wherefore tongues are for a sign not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. If therefore the whole church be come together into one place, and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that ye are mad? But if all prophesy, and there come in one that believeth not, or one unlearned, he is convinced of all, he is judged of all. And thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest. And so, falling down on his face, he will worship God, and report that God is in you of a truth. How is it then, brethren? When ye come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edifying. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most by three, and that by course, and let one interpret. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church, and let him speak to himself and to God. Let the prophet speak two or three, and let the other judge. 
If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. For ye may all prophesy one by one, that all may learn, and all may be comforted. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. What, came the word of God out from you, or came it unto you only? If any man think himself to be a prophet, or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy, and forbid not to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. May God help us to be doers of the word. Amen. My name is Dr. Clement Adebisi Oluwarotimi. I am a medical practitioner. In the last few months, COVID-19 infection caused by coronavirus has ravaged the world, infecting millions of people in the world, causing some deaths. The good news is that thousands have recovered and many more are recovering from the infection as a result of care from the healthcare workers and other stakeholders. As the lockdown is being eased in most places, we must remember that it is not yet over but our desire and prayer is that it will be over soonest. The onus lies now on you and I to take personal responsibility for our safety as individuals and as a society as we go about our daily activities wherever we find ourselves. Prevention of the infection remains the key to overcoming this current pandemic and it is therefore imperative to stick to all safety measures spelled out by the Nigerian Center for Disease Control, that is NCDC. Please ensure you wear face mask before leaving home. Wear a face mask when in any public place. No face mask, no interactions. Wearing face mask and hand gloves can create a false sense of security which leads people to be less careful and intentional about what they touch and not pay attention to social distancing. Don't leave your house more often because you have a face mask on unless you have to go to work or embark on essential trips to places such as markets, grocery stores, banks, as the case may be. Do not use your face mask to justify non-essential public activities or public appearance. Place your face mask over your mouth and nose, tie it behind your head, or use hair lobes and make sure it fits to the back of your hair properly. Don't touch your face mask while wearing it. If you accidentally touch your mask, wash your hands under running water with liquid soap or use alcohol-based hand scrub to sanitize your hand. Remove the mask by untying it or lifting off the air loops without touching the front of the mask or your face. Wash your hands immediately after removing your face mask. Wash your hands before and after removing your face mask. If you have to adjust your mask while wearing it, Make sure you wash your hand under running water with liquid soap or with the use of hand sanitizer. When removing the mask, try to avoid touching the outside of the mask and fold it on itself with the outside in form for storage. For face masks made from clothes, the following will apply. Clean your face mask after each use. Wash with warm soapy water. Once clean, 
thoroughly dry the mask before putting it back on your face. Make sure you do not wear damp or wet face mask. To avoid contaminating your freshly cleaned mask, try to keep it away from common surfaces around the house and store it in a paper bag, avoiding plastic bags and containers that can generate moisture. Don't wear the mask below your nose or leave your chin uncovered. Don't rest your mask under your chin. Don't take off mask to speak with someone, cough or sneeze. Don't wear a mask that is damaged. Don't touch the inside of your mask. Don't touch your face repeatedly when your mask is on. Don't touch your face once you put on your face mask. Observe physical distancing rules. This is aimed to prevent sick people from coming in close contact with elderly people in order to reduce opportunities for disease transmission. Observe physical distance in public places. And that means at least two meters from the person in front or behind you. When you visit the banks or other public places, make sure you observe the social distancing and this you can do by taking your place on the queue and you move away when it gets to your turn you come back to the queue so that you can carry out your activities in doing that you've been able to observe social distancing when using public transportation do not enter vehicles that do not comply with the 60 percent capacity of passengers note there must be spacing between passengers. Ensure you constantly wash your hands with soap and running water or with the use of 60% alcohol-based hand sanitizers. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, or your mouth with your hands. And if you must cough or sneeze, do so with your bent elbow. Wash your hands with soap or with the use of hand sanitizer afterwards. We must disinfect surfaces as frequent as possible, especially if it is regularly used. Avoid unnecessary visitation. You only go out when it is absolutely necessary. Talking about means of payment for goods and services, the use of electronic transfer is encouraged. But if you must use POS or the ATM machine, make sure you sanitize your hand after each use. We are inevitable that currency notes must be used for payment of goods and services. Keep currency notes in small purses, bags, wallets, and wash or sanitize your hands immediately after each handling. Avoid contact with sick persons, especially those with fever, cough, and difficulty in breathing. In conclusion, maintain a good diet. Avoid visiting people at home for now. Check up on friends and family with phone calls, emails, and video calls. Engage in spiritual, physical, and mental activities that will keep your mind and body active. Don't isolate yourself completely. Social distancing is not synonymous to social isolation. Don't be afraid. Don't panic. Social distancing is not synonymous to social isolation. Don't be afraid. Don't panic. Keep communicating with others. Please stay positive. Stay safe. Stay healthy.
I want to be. I want to see. I want to live. I want to give. I want to be more like Jesus. Every day. Every day. Praise the Lord. I welcome you to a reviving and beneficial Sunday worship today in Jesus' name. I praise the Lord for you, for your family, and for everyone around you, and for all your friends that you have invited taking part in this worship service. Today, we have something important to inject into your life, and I believe that you'll never be the same again in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this hour. 
We thank you for this time. We thank you for your love for every one of your people. We are asking you, Lord, that this Sunday worship service will be a reviving time for everyone, a refreshing time for everyone, and power, inspiring event for everyone in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. Help us, Lord, to rediscover and to recover everything we have lost and let the strength of the Lord and the might of the Spirit come upon everyone worshiping with us today in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. Today already we have studied from Psalm 8 and from Psalm 9 in our search the scripture session. And this time now I want to look at Psalm 8. And I'm taking some verses out of Psalm 8. And from there we're launching into what the Lord has for us today. But then let me go back to uh, Genesis chapter 1. In Genesis chapter 1 it says, verse 26, And God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And then it says in verse 27, it says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he, he, male and female created he them. Verse 28, look at this, and I want you to notice a particular word here, and God bless them, and God will bless you today, and will continually bless you, and God said unto them, be fruitful, you'll be fruitful in every way, spiritually you'll be fruitful, materially you'll be fruitful, in the work of your hand, you will succeed and you'll be fruitful in Jesus' name. It says, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth, fill up the earth and subdue it. Look at this and have dominion and have dominion. You're not supposed to be a trodden down man, a trodden down woman. You're supposed to stand and you're supposed to have backbone and you're supposed to have authority. You're supposed to have dominion. Adam was created. Adam and Eve were created to have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Eventually, I'm sure you know the story. Man fell from grace to grass. Man fell from the high tower where God has placed him and he fell into sin and he lost that dominion. We're coming to Psalm 8 now, and I'm reading from verse 4. Psalm 8, reading from verse 4. It says, What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? Look at verse 5. It says in verse 5, For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. In verse 6, it says, for thou madest him to have dominion. You see that? You remember that? We read that in Genesis chapter 1 and in verse 28. It says, now you made him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. And thou hast put all things under his feet. The point I want to make a reference to here is found in verse 4. That question in verse 4 that says, what is man? What is man? You see, as you ask that question and you're asking, what is man? You have to describe the man you're talking about. You have to define the man you're talking about. Because you see, there was man at creation. What do you know about the man at creation? We're told in Ephesians chapter 4. Reading from verse 24. It says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24, and that she put on the new man. You see, there's an old man. There's a new man. And so when you're asking the question, what is man? Put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. When God created man and man came out straight from the hand of the almighty God, that man was created in the image of God. 
He was created in the likeness of God. He was created in righteousness and true holiness. So when you say, what is man? We will say at creation. He was a creature of God like God. Righteous and holy and godly. But then after man fell, you're asking the same question, what is man? We're looking at man now without Christ in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 12. Ephesians chapter 2, reading from verse 12, it says that at that time, it's referring to the time before you knew Christ. At that time, ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So, when you say, what is man? You have to define the man, describe the man you're asking of. What is man at creation? He was a holy, righteous creature of God. What is man without Christ? Look at verse 1 of this, Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And he was equal king, who were dead in trespasses and sins. What is man without Christ? It's a transgressor and a sinner. Look at verse 2. It says in verse 2, wherein in time past, ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now walketh in the children of disobedience. What is man without Christ? Is a person who doesn't have any control of himself, any power by himself. is dominated and is run over and ruled over by the devil. In fact, it says in verse 3, look at verse 3 there, among whom also we all had a conversation in times past. Before we knew Christ, we were like the rest of the world. We didn't have any power. We didn't have any dominion. And it says, we're walking the laws of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And we're by nature. Look at this. After man fell, the nature of sin then came. The nature of Satan now came. The nature of transgressors now came. And it says, we were by nature the children of wrath. Even as others were asking the question, what is man at creation? What is man without Christ? Let me now come to another point. What is man after conversion? When the Lord has forgiven us and we are regenerated and we are redeemed and we are ransomed and we are purchased by the blood of the Lamb. And he makes us to become a member of the family of God. Look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 17. Second Corinthians chapter 6, we're looking at verse 17. It says, wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord. You see, he separates us. He takes us away from the things of the And then he says, I'll be a father unto you and you will be my sons and you'll be my daughters, says the Lord. At conversion, we become the children of God. At conversion will become the sons and the daughters of God. At conversion, a change that takes place when no more like Jesus told those Pharisees, your, your father, the devil, and the works of your father, ye will do. But now, you know, we come to the Lord, and as we come to the Lord, we become the children of God. What is a man after conversion? We've seen him at conversion. As God himself said, I'll be your father, and you'll be my sons, and you'll be my daughters. Now, after conversion, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, looking at verse 19, it says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? Is saying that when you come to the Lord, after that conversion, there's a change that has taken place now, and it says, the Holy Ghost dwells in you. It says, which you have of God, and ye are not your own. Verse 20 says, in verse 20 it says, for ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's, because you now belong to God. You see, when we ask the question, what is man? You have to be definite and you have to be clear as to what kind of man you're asking about. Man at creation, that's different. 
Man without Christ, that's different. Man at conversion, that's different. Man after conversion, that's different. Now, man in Christ is born again, and Christ has entered into him. If you abide in me, and I and my word abide in you, you become totally different. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, different. It's not a man not without Christ, a man without grace, a man without any foundation, a man without faith. This is a man that is now in Christ. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, it's a new creature. Old things have passed away. All the old deformity, all the old deficiency, all the old habits, everything passed away. And behold, all things have become new. Now, what is man with Christ? In Christ, yes, a new creature. Now, with Christ. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. And we're looking at verse 6. Ephesians chapter 2, reading from verse 6. And he has raised us up together. He has raised us up together. We were crucified with him. We died with him. And were buried with him. And we were raised up together now like him and with him. And he said, he has raised us up together. And made us see together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus when you compare Eden with the heavenly places, heavenly places, that's higher. When you compare the first Adam and you compare him with the last Adam, Jesus Christ, the last Adam is higher and Jesus Christ is greater and Jesus Christ is mightier. And he says now he has raised us up and we are made to see together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And what is man when he becomes like Christ, when the grace of God so transforms him, and he comes nearer and nearer and nearer unto Christ. And look at this, it tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and we're looking at verse 18, when he makes us to be like him, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, but we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord. We are not looking at the degradation and the disgrace and the defilement and at the description of Adam after he has fallen. We are not looking at the Lord Jesus Christ with open face beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord. We are changed. Look at that. We are changed into the same image. We become like him. We're changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Even as by the Spirit of the Lord. What then happens to us after we're changed, after we're transformed, and we are like him? I come to Galatians chapter 2, reading from verse 20. Galatians chapter 2. Reading from verse 20, it says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, it says, I am crucified with Christ. I'm identified with Christ in his sacrifice. He was my substitute. He took my place and he brought me near unto himself. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. It says, the old nature is not the one alive in me anymore. It's not the one that is motivating me and is propelling me and controlling me. It says, nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Christ liveth in me. And I give him the chance to express himself. I give him the chance to demonstrate himself. I give him the chance to live in me the way he wants to live. Because he makes me like himself. He says, the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What's the consequence of that in 1 John chapter 4? 1 John chapter 4, we're looking at verse 17. 1 John chapter 4, we're looking at verse 17. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. We have boldness in the day of judgment. Why? We're cleared and we're acquitted. 
Why? Because now he has set us free. Now, he gives us the assurance we're going to meet God on the final day. We're not dropping our heads and we're saying we don't know what's going to happen. By faith, we know what's going to happen. By grace, we know what's going to happen. But the love of God demonstrated for us, for you, for me, on the cross of Calvary, we know what's going to happen. And it says, here in the Son of made perfect, the love we have for God, the desire, the affection we have for God. Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Look at this, because, because as he is, as Christ is, so are we in this world. The question then, what is man at creation? Now you understand? The question, what is man without Christ? You understand? What is man at conversion? You understand? What is man at a conversion? You understand? What is man in Christ, a new creature? You understand? What is man seated together with Christ in heavenly places? And what is man when he beholds the face of Christ and is changed and transformed to become like unto him? So today we're considering the message, our recreation and dominion in Christ our recreation and dominion in Christ. It takes up anyone that comes, a sinner, a transgressor, an ungodly person, and he recreates you, and he refashions you, and he remodels you, and then he pulls his dominant power in your life. Our creation. Why don't I say your creation? and dominion in Christ. I'm talking to you. Your own recreation is going to recreate you when he reforms you, when he refines you, and when he translates you from that position of weakness and he brings you to the position of power, it's going to recreate you. Our recreation and dominion in our Christ. There are three things we're looking at as we look at the message. Number one, the defeat of trampled souls without Christ. The defeat of trampled souls without Christ. Point number two, the declaration of a transformed state in Christ. Point number three, the dominion of triumphant saints through Christ. When you go through one, two, three, and you come out cleansed by the blood of the Lamb, energized by the Spirit and power of the Holy Ghost, you will never be the same again, even from this afternoon. After the service, you'll find a new strength, a new power, a new understanding, a new revelation that comes to you. And you're going to start living now at a higher level in your Christian life and in your Christian ministry in Jesus' name. Let's go to point number one. In point number one, the defeat of trampled souls without Christ. Already we have read in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 12, you remember, it says at that time, we were without Christ, we were without uh, the God and without hope in this world. But now it says, but at that time, if we look at Romans chapter 5 verse 6, in Romans chapter 5 verse 6, it said, we didn't remain like that because even though we're without Christ and we're, we're without hope and without faith, but now a change happened. Look at verse 6 of Romans chapter 5. It says, for when we were yet without strength, without Christ, without ability, and without victory, when we were without triumph, when we were without authority, it says, for when we were without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. But let's look at what we were in the past. A day is a section I'm dividing into three parts. Number one, the original dominion of the created man. Number two is the offensive disobedience of the corrupted man. And then number three, the observable depravity the observable depravity of the common man, of the average man, of the man on the street, of the man, a religious man, but he doesn't know Christ. The observable depravity of such a common man. And let's go to number one. We're looking at the original dominion 
of the created man that is of Adam and Eve. We're back to Genesis again in Genesis chapter 1, reading from verse 26. And God said, let us make man, can I stop there and explain, let us make man, that's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. That's the divine trinity right there. Let us make man in our image, our image, Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. After our likeness, Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. When it says our image and it says our likeness, it's talking about righteousness. God is righteous. God is good. God is godly. And God is merciful. And God is perfect. And so when man was created, it was in the likeness of God, in the likeness of uh, Jesus Christ. Now, if you have looked at the life of Jesus without sin, without weakness, without fear, holy and righteous, that's exactly how the original man was. And he had that original dominion of that created man. It says, and let them have let them have the men and the women when they come out of the hands of God created by him. It says, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. In verse 27, it says, so God created man in his own image have you noticed something here? Let us make man in our image. And now God created man in his own image. That's the unity of God. The unity of God. Try unity. Trinity. Let us plurality. And now in his own image, singular, in his own image, in the image of God, created he him, male and female, created he them. And then in verse 28, it says, in verse 28, and God blessed them, and God said unto them, be fruitful. When you come out of the hand of God, you'll be fruitful. When God creates you, and he gives you the reproductive power, you must be fruitful. You'll be fruitful in Jesus' name. Let me hear your amen. It says, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. Subdue it. The earth will not subdue Adam, should not subdue Adam. Adam and Eve shall subdue the earth and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. That's the original dominion. In uh, Hebrews uh, chapter 2 verse 6, it says, But one in a certain place testified, saying, uh, What is man, that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man, that thou visitest him. Look at verse 7. It says in verse 7, Thou madest him a little lower, not too much lower, a little lower than the angels, and thou crownest him with glory and honor, and did set him over the walls of thy hand. It tells us in verse 8 over there, it says, Thou hast put all things, thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he let nothing that is not put under him. Then he says, But now, we see not yet all things put under his feet. That's talking about the future when in the millennial reign, Christ will have real, literal, practical dominion over everyone and he will reign literally and he will be the king, he'll be the Lord, he'll be the one that rules over the whole earth. He said that millennium, we're still waiting for that, but then he says, as at now, we see Christ and we're identified with that Christ. And then God gave uh, Adam and Eve, he gave them a commandment that you'll find in Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, reading from verse 15. A commandment of what to do, a commandment of how to live. Now that they have dominion and they have the power and they have the ability, God never gives you an assignment. He doesn't give you the ability. He doesn't give you the sufficient power to carry that out. And the Lord took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it, to dress it. 
You see, man still had a work to do to dress that garden and to keep that garden from intruders that the serpent shouldn't have entered, that Satan shouldn't have entered. And God gave him the supervisory role that he will keep that garden of Eden. Look at verse 16. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden that may freely eat. Look at verse 17 now. It says, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat. Thou shalt not eat. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now, what happened after that? The man had dominion. Let us see now. We go from the original dominion and we go to the offensive disobedience in Genesis chapter 3. As you look at verse 6, Genesis chapter 3, reading from verse 6, you'll see what happened. Satan came in the form of the serpent and deceived Eve. And then Eve accepted all that deception and did it. Look at Genesis chapter 3 verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to, to be desired to make one wise, she took up the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her. And he did eat. The husband was there. The husband was to keep the garden and not to allow any intruder, any deceiver, any serpent, any Satan to come in. You say, maybe he didn't know that that serpent represented Lucifer. But you understand, he had perfect knowledge at that time. Don't you remember? He gave names to all the animals. All the animals, many of them, all those many speeches, he gave names to them. And when Eve came, that's in chapter 2 I'm referring to, he said, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. He had knowledge. And yet, with all that knowledge, with all that wisdom, and with all that insight, and he was with Eve at the time when the temptation came. And it says, he did eat. And eventually, you know what happened? A curse came. Because when God said, Adam, where are you? Where art thou? Instead of confessing, he gave excuses. The woman whom you have given me, he led me into this. Look at Job chapter 31, verse 33. And see the comment of the Bible, the comment of the word of God on what Adam had done. In Job chapter 31, verse 33, I'm sure you are opening your Bible. If I cover my transgressions as Adam, that's what Adam did. He covered his transgression by hiding my iniquity in my bosom. And so he hid that iniquity, but God discovered. And God said, who told you that this was your condition? And then all the excuses did not allow God to forgive him and to have mercy on him and on Eve at that time. So they were driven out of the garden. We're coming to Romans chapter 5. And you see the consequence of that in Romans chapter 5, looking at verse 12. Romans chapter 5, reading from verse 12. It says, wherefore, as by one man, Adam, as by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. What's that sin? We had that nature of sin. We were born with that nature of sin. Because Adam and Eve had sinned, all the, all the children that came through them, they had that nature of sin. Sin passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. By nature, man became a sinner. By practice, man became a sinner. By habit, man became a sinner. And in destiny, he'll be treated like a sinner, except redemption, except recreation, except forgiveness, except salvation takes place. Look at this now, the observable depravity of the common man. It now says all have sinned, and you can observe that. As you look at man in general, in fact, we're going back to Genesis chapter 5, verse 3. In Genesis chapter 5, reading from verse 3, the depravity that came upon 
every man upon the common man. It says, and Adam lived an hundred and thirty years and begat his son in his own likeness after his image. After man fell, he lost the likeness of God and the image of God. He now had a sinful likeness, a sinful image, a sinful personality. And it says, Adam and Eve now gave birth to children in their own image, after their own likeness, and called his name Seth. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. Genesis chapter 6, reading from verse 5. Open your Bible. It says, And God saw the wickedness of man, that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That's what man became because man had fallen, because man has been defiled, because man became depraved. Every imagination of the thoughts of his heart became evil, only evil, continually evil. Look at Job chapter 14, and we're looking at verse 4. Job chapter 14, reading from verse 4. Who can bring a clean sin out of an unclean, not one? How do you see that? He's saying Adam became unclean, Eve became unclean, and they came together. You know, the first child was not born when they were in the state of innocence, when they were in the status of dominion. The first child was not born when they were still holy and righteous, having the image of God and having the likeness of God after they had fallen after they had been driven out of the garden of Eden. That's when the first child was born. And all the children that were born since that time, outside the garden of Eden. And so that's why it's saying, who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? Not one. In Job chapter 25, Job chapter 25, reading from verse 4. How can then man be justified with God? Man ordinarily. Man that has not known the saving grace of God. How then can man be justified with God? Or how can he be clean that is born of a woman? How can he be clean? Anyone that is born of a woman. He might pretend outwardly as if he has some self-righteousness, but no, everything is dirty and everything is of iniquity. That's why the psalmist says in Psalm 51, verse 5, Psalm 51, verse 5, and then it says, In sin did my mother conceive me, and in sin was I born. You see, when anyone, a baby is born, in sin is that child born, and in sin is that child conceived. Is talking about the depravity of the man. And he tells us in Psalm 58 and verse 3. Psalm 58 verse 3. And he's talking about the man, the one who does not know Christ. And he says in that Psalm uh, 58, and he's saying from verse 3, that the wicked are estranged from the womb. And they go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. You know what that is saying? Nobody teaches a child to tell a lie. Nobody tells a child or teaches a strong a child. A child does not have to go to school to learn how to lie. It's in the nature of that child. It's the depravity in that child. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking in lies. That's why it says in Isaiah chapter 64. Isaiah chapter 64, we're reading now from verse 6. It says, but we are all as an unclean thing. You see that? Everyone. That's what say this is of the common man. This is universal. This is everyone. It says, uh, but we are all as an unclean thing. And all our righteousnesses as filthy rags. And we all do fade away as a leaf. And our iniquities like the wind, the wind is everywhere, iniquities are everywhere. Our iniquities like the wind are taking us away. It tells us in Mark chapter 7, the things that come out of a man, the attitude and the action and the habit that comes out of a man 
and it's observable. Observable depravity of the common man. In Mark chapter 7 verse 21, for from within out of the heart of men, all men without Christ, all men without faith, all men without redemption, all men without salvation. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, not only lies now that were read about in, uh, in Psalm 58 verse 3, but now evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders. In verse 22, it goes on to say, or thefts and thefts and covetousness and wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, and an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, and foolishness. Verse 23 says, all these evil things come from within. Come from within. You know what psychologists say? Psychologists say it is the environment that makes a child to behave a particular way. They say, look at that child. If that child is coming out of a home where the, the father is a drunkard, he also become a drunkard. While they, when these, uh, the parents are doing this, this is what will happen. The Lord Jesus said, all these evil things come from within, not from without, not from the environment. It comes from within and defile the man because of the depravity of the man. In Romans chapter 7, looking at verse 15, Romans chapter 7, reading from verse 15, is still talking about the depravity of man. It's talking about the sinfulness of man. It's talking about man in his normal state, natural state, and his sinful state. And he says, for that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that I do not. But what I hate, that I do. In verse 16, it says, if then I do that, which I would not, I consent unto the law, that it is good. And then in verse 17, it says, now, then it is no more I that do it. Even when I don't want to do it, it's done. It's like the sin is there and then it's generating the evil. It says, now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. This is a man that doesn't have Christ yet dwelling in him, grace yet dwelling in him, and the work of redemption abiding in him. This is the one that has seen dwelling in him. And then he says in verse 18, in verse 18, for I know that in me, that he is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. In verse 19, it says in verse 19, for the good that I would, I do not, and the evil which I would not, that I do. Look at verse 20. Verse 20 says, now if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. And so we have seen. The defeat of the trampled soul without Christ. A change is going to come. When that man comes to Christ, a change is going to come. When that man now knows Christ and the power of redemption works in the life of that individual, whether a boy or a girl, a man, a woman, anyone, a religious man, an irreligious man, when you come to God and there's a transformation, if it has not happened already, it will happen in your life. If you have not experienced it yet, you will experience it even today in Jesus' name. And if you have got it already, you are saved, you are born again, and you a real child of God as we behold Christ afresh today. New life, a new strength, a new power, a new dominion will come unto you in Jesus' name. Let's come to point number two now. In point number two is the declaration of our transformed state in Christ. The declaration of our transformed state in Christ. It transforms us. And when it transforms us, what happens? Look at Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and verse 2. Please open your Bible. In Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy 
acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Look at verse 2 there. It says in verse 2, and be not conformed to this world. Don't say, well, it's Adam. It's Adam because he fell. That's why I'm filthy. Make a change. Christ has come. After Adam fell, Christ came and he showed us the perfect picture of what man could be when man is redeemed. And he can take the weakness away. He can take the deformity away. He can take the deficiency away. He can even take the depravity away from you. And now you can come transformed by the hands of the Lord. And it says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that she may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. When that happens, what will happen? You're recreated. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, reading from verse 23, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Let everything inside you, your thought life, your habit life, and your plan and everything, uh, your mind, your spirit, your soul, everything, uh, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And put on, in verse 24, it says, And that she put on uh, the new man, which after God is created in righteousness, created in righteousness, in recreation will take place. You are created in righteousness and true holiness. As we look at this declaration of our transformed state in Christ, we're looking at three things. Then number one, our true sonship in Christ. Our true sonship in Christ. Number two, our transformed state in Christ. And number three, our treasured similitude, our treasured similarity to Christ. Look at one, our true sonship in Christ. It's in John chapter 1 verse 12. And it says in John chapter 1 verse 12, but as many as received him, as many as will abandon Adam, abandon sin, abandon transgression, turn away from that darkness and from that dark picture. And you turn to Christ and as many as received him, to them he gave power. He gave authority. He gave the privilege to become, look at this, the sons of God to become the sons of God. You are not like that before, but now you repent. You turn away from sin and you hate sin and you denounce sin and you detest sin and you come to the Savior. It says you become sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. When we become sons of God like that, what's the initial thing that happens in Romans chapter 8 verse 14? Romans chapter 8 verse 14, it says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. You become a child of God. You are born again. And the Spirit of God takes over your life. You are not being ruled. You are not being controlled. You are not being directed. You are not being led by the old self, by the old life, and by society, and by what you see around. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. In verse 15, it says, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. We've turned away from Satan, turned away from sin, and now it becomes a father. God becomes a father, and Jesus Christ, our Savior, and the Holy Ghost, our comforter, and our leader, and he leads us in the way of righteousness. And now by the Spirit we call Abba, Father, Daddy, Father. And it says in verse 16, it says in verse 16, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Children of God. And he children heirs. Look at verse 17. He said, because we're children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God. And joint heir with Christ. If so, be that ye suffer with him. Persecution. That we may also be glorified together. And as sons of God. 
through sonship in Christ. Look at what that does for us in Philippians chapter 2 verse 14. Philippians chapter 2 verse 14, it says we do all things now without disputing and without murmurings. And then in verse 15, it says in verse 15, that she may be blameless and harmless sons of God. You see that we're different from that Adam now, the fallen Adam, the filthy Adam, the feeble Adam. We're different now from that Adam because we come to Christ and we live in the strength, in the power, in the grace of Christ. And now we're sons of God that she may be blameless and harmless and the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom you shine as lights in the world. And says in verse 16, in verse 16, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ. He says, we're now demonstrating, we're now shining forth the word of God and the word of light, and we're shining with the light of Christ, so that Paul the apostle and the preachers and the pastors and the leaders will rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Our true sonship in Christ. Now, what does that then translate to? Number two now, a transformed stage in Christ. When you come to Christ, transformation. When you come to Christ, there's a change and there's a newness of life. From within, he recreates us. He transforms us. And things are totally different. And it doesn't matter your age. It doesn't matter your background. When you come to Christ in the real sense, there's a transformed state. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, reading from verse 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. It says, therefore, because of Calvary, therefore, because of the shedding of his blood, therefore, because you now come to Christ and you're holding on to him as your savior, as your redeemer, and he makes that change and that transformation. It says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, is a new creature, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Let's come back to this uh, chapter 3 of uh, 2 Corinthians verse 18, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, and it says, But we all, with open face, beholding us in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image. We're changed into the same image. Look at this, from glory to glory. You abide in Christ, you're continuing Christ, you're looking at Christ. You're not looking at the example of what you see in the world. You're not looking at those stars and they call them stars in the world on the billboard. You're not looking at the people you care of in history. You're pinning and you're focusing your attention on just your Redeemer on Christ your Savior. And it says, as you behold him and you see his life and that reflects on you and that impacts your life. It says we are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Even as by the Spirit of the Lord. In Ephesians chapter 5, reading from verse 25. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. It says in verse 26, that she might sanctify and cleanse it, or the washing of water by the word. That's what he does when we come to him. Number one, he saves us. He forgives us. He takes away the sin. He cleanses up the pollution of sin, and it breaks the hold and the power of that sin in our lives. And now he sanctifies and he cleanses us by the washing of water, by the word. And then in verse 27, it says that he might present you to himself a glorious church, a glorious Christian, a glorious believer, a glorious congregation, a glorious assembly, a rapturable church, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. That's the transformed stage 
of the believer when it comes to Christ. Now look at our treasured similitude to Christ. Our treasured similarity to Christ. We're looking at Romans chapter 8, verse 29. A treasure similitude to Christ. We treasure this. We embrace this. We hold on to this. We believe this. We will not let it go. Like a treasure. You'll not let it go. You'll give up every other thing. So that this treasure will be yours. It tells us over here in, um, in Romans chapter 8 verse 29. For whom he did for no. He also did predestinate, look at this, to be conformed to the image of his son. To be conformed to the image of his son. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. That's the desire of the Lord. That's the intention of the Lord. That's the plan of the Lord. That's the purpose of the Lord. And that is why Calvary took place. And that is why redemption has been made possible to make us conform to the image of his son. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 49. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 49. And as we are born, the image of the earthy, as he, what it means is, we're born the image of the first Adam, the earthly man, and the depraved man, and the fallen man. And as we are born, the image of the earthy, we shall also bear, now that we come to Christ, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly, and that is the reason why we have all that that the Lord has revealed unto us. Look at Colossians chapter 2, reading from verse 6. Colossians chapter 2, reading from verse 6. Now he tells us that as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Don't always be going back to, you know, because of Adam, we in this condition. It says you have received Christ now. Walk ye also in him. It doesn't say, you know, as you see the life of Saul, and as you see the life of Achan, as you see the life of Samson, as you see the life of Solomon, and they did this, and they did this, so am I. It says now you have received Christ. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Look at verse 7. It says in verse 7 of that uh, Colossians chapter 2, it says rooted and built up. You are rooted in Christ and you are built up in him and established in the faith as ye have been taught and abounding therein with thanksgiving. It tells us in verse 9, in verse 9 it says, for in him, in Christ, you are born again. You come to Christ and you dwell in him. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And it says now you are complete in him. Look at verse 10. In verse 10, for ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. You are not complete in him. Dominion has come. Strength has come, ability has come, authority has come, and you can walk in that authority and in the place the Lord has raised you up for and go and walk in the world different from the world, allowing the light of Christ and the light of the gospel and the light of his revelation to shine forth in your life. You will be different, you can be different, you must be different. It brings us to point number three now. In point number three, we're looking at the dominion of triumphant saints through Christ. The dominion of triumphant saints through Christ. Now we have dominion through definite faith in Christ. What does that mean? There's a point in your life that maybe you're standing up, maybe you're kneeling down, whatever the posture you see, in a definite way. I manifest this face, definite face in the Lord. And I want a definite experience as a result of putting my face in the Lord at this time. And when you do that, something happens. Regeneration happens. Salvation comes. Redemption comes. And then if you have been saved and you come back and you put your definite face in Christ, sanctification will take place. The uprooting of the Adamic nature will take place. Internal cleansing 
and total cleansing within will take place and it will give you the very nature of God himself. And then after that has happened, you can still come back and you say you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you will be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria. And then he says unto the uttermost part of the earth. When you put your definite faith in Christ, you are going to have triumph. You are going to have dominion. Dominion over what? Dominion number one over sin and all transgressions. Dominion over self and all tempers. Bad temper, quick temper, angry temper. You have dominion over self and over all tempers. Then you have dominion, number three, over sickness and all tribulations. This one is walking there. That one is walking there. You come to Christ and then you hold on to the power he has given you, he has given us. You have dominion over sickness and over all tribulations. Number four, over all spirits and all terror over all spirits and all terror. Number five, over seducers and traitors. Number six, over the scourge of tongues, over the strife of tongues, over the slanderers by tongues, you have dominion over them. Number seven, you have dominion over Satan and all his temptations. You have dominion. Give me a good amen. You have each, it will be confirmed in your life in Jesus' name. Let's go over one by one very quickly. Number one, you have triumph and you have dominion over sin and transgressions. Look at Romans chapter 6. We're reading from verse 14. Romans chapter 6, verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For sin shall not have dominion over you. Why? Look at verse 18. In verse 18, it says, being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. That's why sin will not have dominion over you, will not have power over you, will not have imposing authority over you, because he makes you free. Look at verse 22. In verse 22, it says, But now, being made free from sin, and become servants to God, not servants to sin, not servants to Satan, not servants to society, not servants to a terrible one that compels you to do evil, not servants to a sin partner, but to become servants to God. Ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. And the end everlasting life. I pray that that dominion will be yours in a greater way than ever before in Jesus' name. Number two, over self and all tempers. Over self and all tempers. Uh, let, let me read uh, from uh, Proverbs chapter 16. Uh, in Proverbs chapter 16, uh, and we're reading from verse 32. It says, He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. Look at this now. And he that rules a spirit, he that has power over his spirit, over self, who is not a uh, flying at everything uh, happening, it says, He that rules a spirit than he that taketh a city. You know, when those soldiers go out and they have battle against the city and they defeat that city, we we'll say they have dominion. But it says, he that rules over his spirit is greater, is mightier, has achieved more than he that taketh a city. It tells us in um, First Corinthians chapter 9, and verse 25, here Paul, the apostle says, I'm that kind of man that I put everything on them. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, reading from verse 25, and every man that striveth for mastery is temperate in all things. Hold on there. You see, there are people, they don't think they can have the mastery. They don't even attempt to have the mastery. They say, I'm there. It's like they are the receiving end. A temptation will come. What can I do? They are not striving for the mastery. And then the powers that be, the powers of the world will come against them. And they're just like that. And they are blown down every time. They're destroyed every time. They're defeated every time. 
they are not striving for the mastery. But it says, every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now, they do each to obtain a corruptible crown, but we are incorruptible. And in verse 26, it tells us, this Paul the Apostle saying that, I will have the mastery, I will have dominion, I will maintain the mastery, I will maintain the dominion. And it says, therefore, I so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. But then it says in verse 27, it says, But I put, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. It says now, what I do is I keep under my body. It says my tongue, I keep that under. My temper, I keep that under. It says the members of my body, I keep it under. My feelings, I keep all that under. It says I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. Lest by any means, when I preach to others, I myself should be a cast away. That's a man striving for the mastery. And that's what the Lord has called you to. That you understand the Lord has come to give us deliverance. He has come to give us dominion. He has come to give us total redemption. And because of that, you want that to be practical in your life. Demonstrative in your life. You strive for the mastery and you put everything under subjection. Number three, we have dominion over sickness and all tribulation. We have dominion over sickness and all tribulation. Look at First uh, Peter chapter 2 Verse 24, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, who is so self, bear our sins in his own body, hold on. He bear our sins in his own body on the tree, hold on there. Before sin came, there was no sickness. And it was sin that brought sickness. It was sin that brought suffering. It was sin that brought death. And it says now, he has borne our sin. If he has taken the sin away, it takes the consequence of sin away. And it takes the sickness away. That's why it says that we being dead to sins. I have often told you, make it personal. And I being dead to sins. I want to hear you. And I being dead to sin should live unto righteousness. Look at this. By whose stripes ye were healed. By whose stripes I was healed. By whose stripes I am healed. You are healed in Jesus' name. I say you are healed in Jesus' name. I want you to look at something in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. Look at this. Who delivered us? Past tense. Who delivered us? Every sickness you had before you were born again, who delivered us? Every infirmity you had because you carried it from your family, it says so delivered us. Every hereditary sin that you had before you came to Christ, who delivered us. Every sickness that attached itself to you because you are descendant of Adam, who delivered us from so great a death and does deliver. Present tense. And does deliver. Today and does deliver this month and does deliver this year and does deliver past tense. He delivered us present tense. He does deliver. Look at this. In whom we trust that he will yet deliver us in the future. He will yet deliver us. He delivered in the past. He delivers in the present. He will yet deliver us in the future. Total deliverance from sin, from sickness, from self. Everything is yours in Jesus' name. Number four, now we have dominion over evil spirit. We have dominion over evil power. Look at Luke chapter 10, reading from verse 19. Luke chapter 10, reading from verse 19. And it says, Behold, I give unto you power. What do you have today? Power. What do you have today? Dominion. What do you have today? Authority over every evil spirit. It says, behold, I give you power. Look at what God has given you. And look at what Christ has given you. And look at what he has established in your life. Rather than you're looking at your body, you're looking at what is whirling there in your brain. 
You're looking at all the things moving around. Don't look at that. Bring them under your feet. And it says, behold. It says, look at this. It says, believe this. It says, embrace this. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions. To tread on serpents and scorpions. What are serpents and scorpions now? Under your feet. Say, under my feet. Say that under my feet. Now you'll tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. No matter who that enemy is, they will not destroy your destiny. No matter who that enemy is, their power of darkness, their power of occultism will not have authority over your life in Jesus' name because now it gives you dominion. And it gives you power, it gives you authority over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nothing shall by any means hinder you. Nothing shall by any means harm you. Nothing shall by any means stop short your life. You live your life to the full. You live to the edge of your life. And you live strong and continue strong until you see the Lord face to face in Jesus' name. He delivers us from spirits and from all terror. Look at 1 John chapter 5, verse 18. 1 John chapter 5, verse 18. It says, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, he has dominion over sin. For we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, he has dominion over self. For we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, he has dominion over sickness, and he has dominion over all the weaknesses of man, he has dominion over all the evil spirits, and he has dominion over himself. He says, he sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God, recreated again, redeemed again, transformed again, changed into the image, and is going from glory to glory again. He that is begotten of God keepeth himself, look at this, and that wicked one toucheth him not. That wicked one toucheth him not. All his terrible things, all his oppression, all his insanity, all is evil. He will not bring upon you. He doesn't have that authority. If you resist the devil, he will flee away from you in Jesus' name. Now, we also have authority and we have triumph and we have dominion over seducers and traitors. Over seducers and traitors. I want you to look at Second Timothy chapter 3 and we're reading from verse 13. Second Timothy chapter 3. We're reading from verse 13. It says, But evil men and seducers, evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse. They will want to demonstrate their wickedness. They will want to demonstrate their evil. They will want to demonstrate their power. All those seducers, they want to entice you into evil and they want to compel you to submit unto them. And it says, Evil men and seducers, they will wax worse and worse deceiving and being deceived deceiving and being deceived but they will not catch you i said they will not catch you because it's going to give you dominion it's going to give you authority over them in jesus name can i hear your amen look at luke now we're looking at luke chapter 11 Luke chapter 11, verse 25, it says in Luke chapter 11, reading there from verse 25, it says, When he cometh, he findeth it swept and garnished. That is, the person who has been saved and the person who has been redeemed, the devil is out, evil powers are out, but if he's careless and he leaves that place, that that empty that evil spirit will try to spy and will try to come back again to see if it is empty. Then it says, but look at uh, verse 26. In verse 26, it says, Then he goes and he taketh to him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in 
and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. You see, when we come to Christ, we need to keep that heart for Christ. And we need to close that heart against all the evil spirit and all the evil powers. And we need to make sure that the blood of Jesus covers us every time. The power of the Lord resides there every time. And the glory the Lord has given us and the dominion the Lord has given us that dominion remains and abides and then you will be strong and then you will be able to stand in that power and that dominion in Jesus name and that evil sin and that evil power and that sin that used to overcome you in the past will not continue to overcome you anymore in Jesus name now we we'll come to number six we're talking about the dominion you have the dominion I have do you have it? Yes, I believe you have it. We're talking about the triumph and the dominion you have over sin and all transgressions. The dominion and the, and the triumph you have over all cell and all tempers. And the dominion you have over sickness and over all, all, the, all the tribulations. The dominion you have over spirits and all terror. The dominion you have over seducers and traitors. Now, the dominion you have over the scourge of tongues. You see, there are people, they use their tongue, they'll slander you, they'll say some things about you so you can be depressed, so you can come down, and so that you lose your victory. But you will not lose your victory in Jesus' name. Look at this in Job chapter 5, and I'm reading from verse 21. Job chapter 5, we're reading from verse 21. It says, Thou shall be hid from the scourge of the tongue. Thou shall be hid from the scourge of the tongue. As uh, you know, people will slander, as, as people will defame, as people will blaspheme, as people will say some things about you that could have discouraged you, depressed you, God will give you the triumph and the victory and the dominion over the scourge of tongues. Neither shall thou be afraid of destruction when it comes in verse 22. Look at verse 22. It says, as destruction and at famine thou shalt laugh. At destruction, you will not cry. At famine, you will not mourn. And you will not weep. And you will not say, what am I going to do now? Look at this condition. You will laugh because you have the victory. You will laugh because you have the dominion. And it says, at destruction and at famine, thou shalt laugh. Neither shalt thou be afraid of the beasts of the earth. Fear will go out of your heart, out of your life completely in Jesus' name. I'm sure you are saying your amen, your corner over there. And in verse 23, in verse 23, it says, For thou shalt be in league with the stones of the field, and the beast of the field shall be at peace with thee. When a man's ways please the Lord, even his enemy shall be at peace with him. And then in verse 24, in verse 24 it says, And thou shalt know that the tabernacle shall be in peace, and thou shalt visit thy habitation, and shall not sin. You keep your dominion, you keep your triumph, and you keep your victory every time, all the days of your life, every day of your life. Victory over the scourge of tongues, over the slander of tongues, over the strife of tongues. Look at Psalm 31 verse 20. In Psalm 31 verse 20, thou shalt hide them in the secret of thy presence from the pride of man. He will hide you. In the secret of his presence, from the pride of man, look at this, thou shalt keep them secretly in a pavilion, look at this, from the strife of tongues, from the slander of tongues, from the scoffers with their tongues, from the scorners of their tongues, the Lord will hide you and the Lord will keep you and their words and their tongue. And their utterances will not bring you down, 
will not depress your life, will not destroy your life. You'll keep victorious, triumphant, having dominion every time in Jesus' name. Number one, you have dominion and victory over sin and all transgressions. Number two, you have dominion and you have triumph over self and all temples. Number three, you have dominion and you have triumph over sickness and all tribulations. Number four, you have dominion over spirits and all terror. Nothing terrifies you. And you have dominion, number five, over seducers and all traitors. Number six, you have dominion over the scourge of tongues, over the strife of tongues, over the scorners of their tongues. You have dominion in every area. Number seven, now, you have dominion over Satan and all his temptations. You have dominion over Satan and all his temptations. Look at First Peter. In First Peter chapter 5, reading from verse 8 and verse 9. In First Peter chapter 5, it says in First Peter chapter 5 verse 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. It says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about. Why be sober? And why be vigilant? Look at this. If, for example, you are armed as a soldier, and you have all the ammunition to defeat any terrorizing person coming against you or against what you are watching over. If you are not sober, if you are not vigilant, if you are drunk, if you are careless, if you are frivolous, if you are gambling, if you are just taking things at ease, although you have the gun in your hand, although you have everything in your hand, because you are not sober, because you are drunk, you will not be able to fight and wage war effectively over that terrorizing person coming. But you must, with all the ammunition you have, with all the guns you have, and with everything that you have, the armor of God in your life, you must be sober and vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a running lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Look at verse 9. It says in verse 9, Whom resist ye in the faith, resist steadfast in the faith. You don't resist haphazardly and carelessly and indolently and slumberingly as if you are asleep. You are barely able to stand up. Wake up and resist the devil steadfast in the faith. You cannot resist him with unbelief. You have to believe what you have. And you have to believe the triumph and the dominion and the redemption the Lord has provided for you. And it says, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Others have gone through the same thing and they overcame. And Jesus said, because I overcome, ye too, you will overcome. It tells us in First John chapter 2, First John chapter 2, reading from verse 13. In First John chapter 2, reading from verse 13, it says, I write unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because ye have overcome the wicked one. Others overcame, you overcome. I said you overcome. He says, I'm writing to you, young men, young men in the faith. They have come to the Lord. They are abiding in the Lord. And the word of God is abiding in them. And the, and the grace of God is abiding in them. And the confidence of faith abides in them. He says, I write unto you, young men, because ye have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because ye have known the Father. Look at verse 14. In verse 14 it says, I am reaching unto you, fathers, because ye have known him. That is from the beginning. I am reaching unto you, young men, because, 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 because ye are strong. You are a child of God, because ye are strong. 
You are growing in the Lord because you are strong. You are beholding his face and you are moving on and you are being transformed from glory to glory because you are strong. You are putting on the whole armor of God and you are strong in the day of battle because you are strong. And the word of God abides in you and ye have overcome the wicked one. Ye have overcome the wicked one. You'll be an overcomer every day, every moment, all through your lives. In Jesus' name. Look at First John chapter 4, verse 4. In First John chapter 4, reading from verse 4, it says, Ye have got little children and have overcome them. Ye have got little children and have overcome them. You are born again. You have got. You are saved. You have got. You are redeemed. You have got. You are cleansed. You have got. You are brought into the kingdom of God. You have got. You have left your sin. You have left the past and you are holding on to the Lord. It says you have got little children and have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And that greater one will manifest his dominion, his power over your life in Jesus' name. You are an overcomer. I am an overcomer. I can I hear you? I am an overcomer. You'll be an overcomer in Jesus' name. I want you to look at uh, the word of God now in Romans chapter 8, verse 37. Romans chapter 8, we're looking at verse 37. It's telling us, it says me, in all these things, temptation, in all these things, all the transgressions, in all these things, all the temptations, in all these things, all the strife of tongues, in all these things, all the traitors, in all these things, all the terrible things that might happen. It says, nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Through him that loved us. Through him that loved us. You'll be an overcomer. You're already an overcomer. And the power and the grace and the strength that overcomes the Lord puts in your life more and more ever in Jesus' name. As I come to a conclusion, I'm going to read that verse of scripture again that we read before in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Verse 18, and he's saying, but we all, don't count yourself out. You are there now. You are a child of God. You are born again, but we all. You are redeemed. You are saved, but we all. You are sanctified, and the depravity is taken away from you, but we all. You are a child of God, and the power of the Spirit of God is upon your life. And he says, and we all, with open face, with open face, you're not looking down. You're not closing your eyes. And when you see things happening that might terrify you, you don't dodge. You don't turn your face another way with open face, beholding as in a glass. Beholding the Lord as in a glass. It's like you can see the Lord. You can see the invisible one. Beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. The glory of the Lord. See him that brings us to glory and see him that brings us to all power. It says we are changed into the same image from glory to glory, from glory to glory, from strength to strength, from power to power, from deliverance to deliverance, from dominion to dominion, from triumph unto triumph. It says we are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Even as by the Spirit of the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord is right there with you. As you are listening to the Word of God right now. It's very close by. He wants to make of you a new man. He wants to make of you a new creature. Bold and authoritative and having dominion and triumphant. He wants to make of you a different man that is confident and whatever the enemy and whatever the challenge, starting from sin to self to sickness to evil speech to seducers to the scourge of the scorners and to Satan himself, he gives you the victory. Transformation time has come. 
upliftment time has come. The Lord is going to do great things in your life, in your heart, in your spirit, in your soul. It's going to transform you to be another man, even from now on, having dominion of the triumphant saints through Christ. Why don't you rise up and say, Lord, I thank you for the revelation of your word unto me today. A recreation can happen right now. And a redemption can happen right now that you have never seen. A reformation, a translation can happen now that you have never experienced. Forget everything around you and look up to God and you can have dominion restored unto you. What were lost in Adam, you can regain today. What were lost in Adam, you can have restored today. You can rediscover today and come to realization in your life today. Any sin there, open up to the Lord, confess it to the Lord, and turn away from it and say, Lord, here I am. I open up my heart, I open up my life, I open up my past, I open up my present, I open up everything about my life unto you. And then his cleansing hand will come, his redeeming hand will come, his recreating hand will come, his transforming hand will come. It will transform you. It will transform you. And it can take place right now in a moment of time. Tell the Lord, tell the Lord. Salvation is very important. Except a man be born again, he cannot see, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. He cannot enter into this dominion of the kingdom, into this power of the kingdom, into this triumph of the kingdom. A man must be born again. You must be turned around and your life must be turned around. Tell the Lord, and if you are saved and you are sure, and the Spirit of God is bearing witness with your heart that you are born again, that you are a child of God, that you are redeemed of the Lord. You can go a step further and consecrate me everything on the altar. I want to be like Christ. I want to be like my Savior. I want to be like the Redeemer. I want to be like the King in dominion. I want to be like the one that was never conquered by any tempter and by any temptation. I want to be totally, fully, completely like him as he is. So I want to be right in this world, in my inner man, in my spirit, in my soul, in my mind. I want to have the mind of Christ. Lay everything on the altar and consecrate everything to the Lord. The Lord will do it. The Lord will do it is the one who sanctifies. He that sanctifies, and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause is not ashamed to call them brethren. You come closer to him in a closer relationship. You come closer to him in a more intimate relationship as you get sanctified. And if you're sanctified, and the Spirit of God is bearing witness with your heart, you're saved, you're sanctified, you're purified, you're made holy, you are made godly and the inner man has been turned around. You are totally, fully transformed. And now the Lord is bringing you from glory unto glory. You can have the power of the Holy Ghost as well in your life. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But greater is he that is among you that will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Because John did baptize with water. But he shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days since. And he shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And he shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. You can have that power. You can have peace with God's salvation. You can have purity in Christ's sanctification. You can have the power of the Holy Ghost. That's Holy Ghost baptism, and you can have triumph. You can have dominion. He can do that for you. Ask in faith, nothing wavering. Ask in faith, nothing wavering. There'll be a recreation. There'll be a dominion. And then after the service, with that dominion, with that triumph, with that overcoming power, you go out in the strength of the Lord, and all those things that used to conquer you, they'll be under your feet in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this hour. We thank you for this moment. We thank you, Lord, because you have revealed to us today as a child of God, even babes in Christ, we can have dominion. 
we can have victory. We can have triumph. I will pray, Lord, all the dominion, all the victory, all the triumph that a child of God ought to have because of Calvary and because of redemption that is accomplished in Christ and through Christ, give to everyone in Jesus' name and move your people forward to sanctification, real sanctification, experiential sanctification that really purges the heart, purifies the heart, and that gives us Christ sitting on the throne of our hearts and leading us and we're leading by him so that, Lord, the dominion of the sanctified, the triumph of the sanctified, and the victory of the sanctified, you grant to everyone in Jesus' name. And those who are saved, and those who are sanctified, and we need the power of God, the power of the Holy Ghost, Lord, we're asking that you fill your people with power. I pray, oh Lord, you energize your people will pour out the power, the endowment of the Holy Ghost upon every sanctified vessel in Jesus' name. Oh Lord, we'll pray as a church. We'll stand up as a militant congregation, a militant assembly, a triumphant congregation, a congregation having dominion. And everywhere we are, in every village, every town, every city, every community, this triumph and this dominion of the righteous, of the redeemed, you give unto every one of us and every congregation in Jesus' name that sin will not have dominion over any of us as individuals, as families, as local churches, at the whole church, in Jesus' name, that self will not have dominion over us, that sickness will not have dominion over us, that evil spirits will not have dominion over us, and that corners and scoffers and the scourge of tongues will not have dominion over us, that seducers will not have dominion over us, and more importantly, that Satan will not have dominion over your church in Jesus' name. On this rock you said, I built my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail over that church. And you've given us the key of the kingdom, that whatever we bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever we lose on earth is loosed in heaven. We pray, Lord, everyone will enjoy that dominion, that triumph to the full in Jesus' name. And as a church together, united was time. Every one of us corporately will enjoy that dominion, that triumph in Jesus' name. Testimonies will be coming from everywhere that all who are connected with this church directly in congregation or online, every one of us will have the dominion. Confirm it in every life, Lord. Confirm it in every family, Lord. Confirm it in every community, Lord. Confirm it in every local church. Confirm it in the church at large in Jesus' name. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. And God keep you in triumph, in dominion, always overcoming every time in Jesus' name.